Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes, and I'm very privileged to have Mr. Howard Bloom here, and uh, we're going to learn about him and have a great conversation, and uh, you have a few books out, from my understanding. Uh, Seven, and I'm finishing my eighth. Oh, my goodness. Well, before we kick this off, tell us a little bit about you. Well, uh, basically, the story is very simple. I started in microbiology and theoretical physics at the age of 10 and uh, came up with a theory of the beginning, middle and end of the universe that predicted something that wouldn't be discovered for 38 years, dark energy, when I was 16 wow. and and have always had a fascination with the ecstatic, with the uh, uh, with the experiences that lift you out of yourselves. Um, and um, so I ended up uh, after a lifetime in science, basically, in something I knew absolutely nothing about in popular culture. Popular culture was the culture of the kids who used to beat me up and chase me around the block. And uh, I founded a PR firm in the music industry, and it ended up being the biggest PR firm in the music industry. And I worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, ZZ Top, uh, Joan Jett, people like that. Wow. And, and uh, so that's what brought me down to Texas a bunch of times was ZZ Top. And uh, then I got uh, real sick and that allowed me, and I couldn't work anymore. I had to take to a bed and I was too weak to speak for five years and too weak to have people uh, in the room with me. Mm. And uh, I went back to my science full time and since then, I've founded, I think, three international scientific organizations. I run four space groups right now. Um, I've worked with people like Buzz Aldrin and the 11th president of India and, uh, and Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon, um, and people of that sort. And, um, that's, and, and I was able to, I had started writing a book before I got sick. I was halfway through writing it, and I finished it and published it and uh and my books are allegedly books of original scientific thought but they i write them to be so delicious that if you read a single sentence in one of them you can't put it down until you get to the end of the book that's the goal um but a lot of people have said that that actually is what happens so how does the little kid get that interested in science well, um, I grew up in a town called Buffalo, New York, and not a single soul in Buffalo, New York wanted to have anything to do with me. The other kids didn't want to have anything to do with me. My parents didn't have time, didn't care. So, um, I, and so I was a very lonely child. And one day I was 10 years old. I had just learned to read. I was late in learning to read. Um, and um, and there, a book appeared in my lap in my family living room, and it said the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And it told the example of Galileo, and it got the story all wrong, as if Galileo had been willing to go to the stake to defend his truth, which didn't turn out to be the case, but I wouldn't find that out for 30 years. Um, and uh, the second law of science, it said, is look at things run right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. And it gave the example of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the guy who uh, invented the microscope and looked down at a, a drop of pond water and discovered that there were what he called animalcules just teeming in it. And that we humans have been sharing this planet with um, animals so small or animalcules so small that we'd never seen them. There was a whole invisible world that we were sharing the planet with. and We didn't have a clue. Um, and those two rules, the rule of courage and the rule of awe and wonder and curiosity, just galvanized me, Kyle. They absolutely hit me over the head. And I suddenly felt 
like, hey, this is a group of people I can hang out with because they're never going to try to pick up their bat and ball and find another baseball field so they don't have to pick me for a team, which had happened to me once in Buffalo for a very simple reason. They can't say it only because they're all dead. Um, and that became the group of people I hung around with. I started to read two books a day. I read one book under the desk and I read another book when I got home. And most of them were science and science fiction. And I started to absorb a lot of science. And then my mom, who, as I said, didn't have time for me most of the time. Um, my mom set up a meeting uh, between me and the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo. And now think about this. You're a 12 year old. What head of a graduate physics department is going to want to have anything to do with you? No one in his sane mind. Um, so I would imagine it was probably a courtesy call to buy my mom off or something like that. No, we spent an hour in his office. We were discussing the hottest scientific topic of the day, which was Big Bang versus steady state theory of the universe and the interpretation of the Doppler shift. And an hour later, we came out of his office and he put his hand on my shoulder and said, you don't have to save for grad school for him. He'll get fellowships in theoretical physics wherever he wants. And uh, plus I built my, well, I co-designed a computer that year that won some science fair awards. I built my first Boolean algebra machine. Um, and uh, my mom did another remarkable thing. She persuaded the head of the valve company that made the valves for the first plane to break the sound barrier mm -hmm. and the first plane to reach the edge of space with humans in it. She persuaded this head of research and development to give me personal tutoring in outside the box science when I was 12. And by the time I was 16, I was working at the world's largest cancer research center. It was a summer job um, and I was an intern and I was supposed to be researching the immune system, but that didn't particularly interest me. So that's when I came up with the theory of the begin beginning, middle and end of the universe that predicted dark energy. And you can find that theory in a five and a half minute animation um, on uh, YouTube these days. It's had about 800,000 800, hits. Right. Now are we talking dark matter or? No, dark thing? matter had not been hypothesized in those days. We're talking about, there's something called the CPT problem, the charge parity and time problem. And it's this, if matter and antimatter are created in equal amounts, at the same time, where's all the antimatter? You've got these two universes that come out of the hole at the center of the bagel. One is the normal universe up on top of the bagel. Mm -hmm. The other is the antimatter universe on the underside of the bagel. And they shoot away from each other um, until they run out of energy. And then like a cannonball taking a parabolic arc, um, they start they start sensing each other because they share a common language and the common language is gravity. Mm -hmm. So the gravity of each one pulls the other and they move faster and faster and faster until they reach the outer edge of the bagel and then they annihilate and they become the hole at the center of the next big bagel. So that's the whole theory, but, but what puzzled astronomers uh, and astrophysicists was they discovered that at a certain point, this is in 19, 1998, that the universe begins to move away from itself. That is that the galaxies start, they've been expanding. Everybody knew that since 1928, um, but the rate of their expansion begins to increase. They begin to accelerate. Now to accelerate takes energy. I mean, you know, you get into a Porsche and you want to accelerate the highway speed as fast as possible and see how fast this little sucker will go. And to do that, you put your foot on the gas. You give it extra gas. In other words, it takes fuel of some kind to, to produce acceleration. So the question was, where is the universe getting the ed energy for this acceleration? And they, they called it, they have no idea of what it is, but they called it dark energy. Well, the big bagel theory explains dark energy. The two universes begin to, to accelerate because they begin to come toward each other, attracted by each other's gravity. And the further they get toward each other, the faster they move. 
Um, so they accelerate all the way to the point of annihilation on the outer rim of the bagel. So that's it. I was 16 and, uh, and I threw it away as comic book science. Um, you know, it was so simple. How could it possibly be for real? And then when uh, dark energy was discovered in 1998, all of a sudden I had to haul it out of the closet again because it had predicted that. So you were young Sheldon before young Sheldon was young Sheldon. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, so, and, and then the question becomes, how in the world did you get into rock and roll? And that's a whole other thing. I mean, when I was 12, I'd been reading two books a day mm -hmm. um, for two years. So that's a lot of reading. And, um, and my parents decided to take me off to synagogue for high holiday services. And I, first of all, they tried to get me in a suit, which they succeeded in doing. I don't know how they did it. I hated suits. They got me into their blue four-door Frasier automobile. I don't know how they pulled that off either. And then when they got to Richmond Avenue where the synagogue was, I wouldn't go any further. So I'm holding on to the sturdy American made frame of door frame of this car with two hands like this. And my parents are dragging me by my ankles, trying to get me out of the car. And I have a sudden revelation. Um, remember Galileo and his importance in my life, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. Well, Galileo took this newfangled invention, um, the lens. And instead of looking horizontally, there were these things called spy glasses, and they had a lens on either end of a tube, and you used them to see an army coming over the horizon before the army could see you. Um, it was a top secret military weapon, so Galileo was in charge of armaments for whatever city he was living in at the time. And he got the plans for one of these and built one himself. He, this thing was built for horizontal viewing. Mm -hmm. And he had this outrageous idea, turn the device up to the skies and look at the heavens. And he discovered a bunch of things that look like balls of stone up there and totally changed the way we see the universe and our relationship to it. And um, meanwhile, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, remember him, the inventor of the microscope? Mm -hmm. So he did the same thing, except he took his lens, which he used, he was a draper. He was importing fabrics from all over the world. So he used the lens to see how fine the weave was on the fabric. And that was horizontal viewing. And he decided to take the lens and turn it in another unexpected direction, down. And that's when he looked at pond water. And, uh, and a good deal more. I mean, he sent an entire report to the Royal Society that came from looking at fresh human sperm and it took me about 40 years to realize where he got the fresh human sperm. But at any rate, so this guy really was courageous about looking at things right under his nose and then fessing up to it. One way or the other, both of these guys had taken a lens and turned it in an unexpected direction. So there I am holding onto the door frame, and my parents are dragging me by the ankles. And I realize, okay, I'm an atheist. So to me, there is no God in the skies and there is no God under the earth. But there are gods in this picture. And where are they? They're in my parents. They're when the absolute determination, this total overwhelming passion with which they are trying to get me to a synagogue. Um, and if there are gods inside my parents, there have got to be gods inside of me. So one of my quests in science became to find the gods inside of us. And that um, in essence, is how I got into rock and roll. Because, um, uh, well, I continued in science and I uh, dropped out of Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and went looking for the beatniks and couldn't find them. And people started dropping out of their jobs and following me. And all I had were big questions how in the world do you achieve Zen Buddhist Satori? And people thought I had answers because I was pursuing the questions with such passionate determination. And later on, the little group of people that formed around me, along with, I'm sure, many other people, were given a name, and we were called the Hippies. So I accidentally helped start the hippie movement in 1962, um, which is two years before the 60s realized that it had a name, um, that, it wasn't <laughs> the fifth, that it wasn't the 50s anymore. And then I went back to um, school at NYU, which is the only school that would take a dropout 
Because in those days, Kyle, there was no phrase dropout. Mm -hmm. If you were somebody who had dropped out of school and wanted to get back in, there was no name for you. You were just this weird non-category. Um, and NYU was the only school that would take people who had done that. So I went back to NYU and, and I decided to, when I was 12 years old, I was in eighth grade and a girl in class had swiveled her eyes in my direction. And I didn't realize it, but that had never happened to me before. Mm -hmm. And then she made eye contact, which was shocking because that had never happened to me before. And she said, I told my mom, you understand the theory of relativity. And I didn't have the guts to tell her that I didn't understand the theory of relativity. So as soon as school got out, I jumped on my bicycle and I drove down to the local library. And I said, to the librarians literally knew me better than my mother did. And they said, I said, give me everything you've got on relativity. And they rummaged through the stacks and they brought me two books, a great big fat book, a little tiny skinny book. And uh, I put them in my bicycle rack and pedaled home as fast as I could and started reading the great big fat book because I had learned at that age that if you put yourself through the most difficult process possible, you don't think you're understanding anything, but if you get to the very end, you will have understood something. Um, so, right. but, but eight o'clock at night came, I'd been sitting there for almost four hours and it was a book that was all equations. It had about seven words of English per page. And I have never understood an equation in my life. So um, I was up to page 50 and I realized it's two hours before my mom is gonna put me to bed. If I don't understand the theory of relativity in two hours, I'm screwed tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna be humiliated at school. So I jumped into the little tiny book and the little tiny book, which was written entirely by Albert Einstein. The other book, the big one had been written with two collaborators. The little skin in the little skinny book, there was an introduction. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's only happened to me in my life, maybe twice. It felt as if Einstein reached out through the page of the book and grabbed me by the front of my shirt and put his nose up to mine and said, schmuck, listen up <laughs> to be a genius. It's not enough to be able to come up with a theory that only seven men in the world can understand. To be a genius, you have to be able to come up with that theory and then express it so clearly that anyone with a high school education and a reasonable degree of intelligence can understand it. In other words, when I was 12, Albert Einstein, through the pages of a book, told me, you want to be an original scientific thinker, you're going to have to be a writer. And not just any writer. You're going to have to be remarkably lucid and you're going to have to be delicious. Um, so I started to take writing very seriously. So when I went back to NYU, among other things, I was taking uh, poetry classes from the poet in residence at NYU. And one day uh, he said, Bloom, I want you to wait until the classroom is empty, till everybody's walked out. I want you to close the door and I want you to sit there. And he pointed at the chair right across the desk, the bowling out chair, and Kyle, this did not sound good. Um, <laughs> so I waited and I closed the door and I sat down in the bowling out seat. And he said, look, you, last year, I asked you to be on the staff of the literary magazine. You never even showed up. This year, I'm telling you, you are the literary magazine. You are the editor of the literary magazine. You don't even have a faculty advisor. The minute you walk out that door, you're it. Now walk out that door. So I walked out the door looking as if I'd been hit over the head with a sledgehammer. Um, and because I hated literary magazines, you know, they have these eggshell, eggshell blue covers that put you to sleep. They have typefaces that are so badly chosen that they make you gag. If you went to a room with a giant orgy and you threw a literary magazine into the room, it would empty the room in five minutes. So, <laughs> so a kid um, came across me in the corridor and he said, you look disturbed about something. Can I help you? And I said, yes, I, I've just been named the editor of the literary magazine. And he invited me down for a cup of coffee now, because I hadn't grown up with other human beings in Buffalo. I'd just grown up with books and guinea pigs and lab rats. 
I didn't know human rituals. So I didn't know what have a cup of coffee meant. But I followed him. We went to a coffee shop and he ordered a cup of coffee and I ordered a glass of water. And he asked me one of the most important questions of my life. He said, if you could do anything you wanted with this magazine, what would it be? And I said, it would be a picture book. So he said, fine, there's your answer. And I went out and I found a staff of artists. So the, the head of the graduate physics department had been right. I got graduate fellowships at four different universities, um, but not in what he thought. By now I was onto something that didn't have a name yet. I was gonna have to paste it together myself. Today it's called neuroscience. Um, and um, I, it was starting the summer and I walked into the apartment of the most amazing artists of all the artists that I'd found for the literary magazine. And the room was empty, no furniture, just a wall to wall carpet. And he, his wife and his three-year-old were all sitting on the floor and they were all crying. And I asked them what the matter was. Um, and they said, well, our furniture has just been repossessed. Our electricity is about to be cut off. Our phone is about to be cut off and we're being thrown out of our apartment because mm -hmm. we can't pay the bills. And I said, but your work is absolutely brilliant. If anybody sees it, they're going to give you work. So I haven't settled on a summer job yet. And why don't you give me your portfolio? I'll take it out for two weeks. I'll get you enough work to pay your rent. And then I'll figure out what my summer job is going to be. Um, so he, he said, well, if you're going to take my work out, you have to take out the work of my best friend, because we came from Boston together to found an art studio together. And the work of his best friend was nauseating. But hey, I got a man in serious trouble here, a family in serious trouble here. So let's not quibble. I took the work of both artists and the nauseating friend had a wife who was actually a very good designer. So her work went into the portfolio too. And I started to take the portfolio out. And um, by the end of the summer, I had New York Magazine interested in doing a feature on us but I hadn't landed a single piece of work. Plus, so here I am, I've been fascinated with the gods inside of us since I was 12 years old. And I realized grad school is gonna be Auschwitz for the mind. I'm never going to be able to find that kind of ecstatic experience that I was looking for when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. um, the experience of the gods inside of us, never. I'll be giving paper and pencil tests to 22 college students in exchange for a college credit. And how much of an ecstatic passion am I gonna see in that room with the college students? Zero for the rest of my life. Um, and uh, at the, when September came, and also my wife, I had gotten married at the end of my freshman year of college. And my wife, who'd had a previous husband, who was a student at Dartmouth, um, had said, how, you know how wives will say things that they can then deny that they've ever said? They sort of say them <laughs> under the table. Um, and she had said, I'm tired of having uh, students for husbands. And I didn't want to lose my wife. And you put all these things together. And I called Columbia University and said I wouldn't be coming that year. I'd come the next year. And I kept building with the art studio. And I realized something that popular culture that this gave me what I called a periscope position, you know, the periscope on a submarine. Mm -hmm. um, you come up near the surface, you use the periscope to look around you. Well, this gave me a periscope position in a field where I really didn't belong, popular culture. But if I was likely to find the gods inside of us, I was far more likely to find it here than in grad school, far more likely. And that eventually led to my becoming the biggest publicist in the rock and roll business, because where I did something I called secular shamanism. In other words, if you came to my office and you were interested in having me work with you, I sat you down and I gave you a simple little speech. And I explained to you, if you expect me to fashion an artificial mask and to tell you that with this image, I'm gonna make you a star, then I'm gonna send you to my best competitor. If you're gonna work with me, you have to understand music is not about an exchange of pieces of plastic. In those days, records were made of vinyl. Um, it is not about an exchange of pieces of money. 
It's not about an exchange of downloads. It's an exchange of human soul. Mm -hmm. And when you sit in front of a blank piece of paper at two o'clock in the afternoon and you have to write a lyric, you know damn well you can never write another lyric again in your life. You have no idea of how you've ever written a lyric in the past. And on a reasonably good day, by four o'clock in the afternoon, there's a lyric in front of you. And maybe once or twice in your life, that lyric is so perfect that it felt, feels like the, the lyric wrote itself through you. My job is going to be to find the God inside you that wrote that lyric. Um, when you go on stage and it's a really good night and you can see the pupils of the audience dilating and you can see their faces melting and you see them melt into one big amoeba-like blob and reach a pseudopod, reach a tunnel out to you and send their collective energy through you and you become like an empty tunnel. You become like an empty pipe and you feel the energy of the audience go up to somewhere around your head and be utterly transmogrified and then flow back down to the audience again. When you feel like you are being danced as if you are a marionette on the stage, my job is to find the God inside of you that danced you during that performance. And then my job is going to be to introduce you to those gods. And if you are willing to go through this, because it's going to take me six weeks to just study everything I can on you, and then I'm going to have to meet with you in your own surroundings, wherever that is, without wives, without managers, without assistants, without anybody. It's just going to be me and you in a room trying to find the gods inside of you. If you're willing to deal with that, then I'll take you on as a client. So that was my job. My job, remember the telescope that instead of turning up to the heavens and down to the earth, I needed to turn deep inside. I mm -hmm. was turning that lens deep inside of each one of my clients because they, when they were on stage on a really good night, they became the tongue of the audience. They became the means of expression of that audience. They were filled with that audience. The best description comes from Peter Townsend, the founder of the band The Who. Mm -hmm. um, there was a point at which Peter Townsend and George Harrison of the Beatles were trying to get Eric Clapton off of heroin. And George tried it and he got nowhere, absolutely nowhere. And then Peter Townsend went to Eric Clapton and said, look, I understand why you do heroin. You go out on stage in front of 17,000 or 70,000 people. And for 70 minutes, you are the pipe through which the souls of those 17,000 people flow. Mm -hmm. And the souls of those people flow through the empty pipe of you up to the Godhead. And that's where they are transformed and go back down to the audience again. So for an hour and 10 minutes, you are filled with the souls of 17,000 people and the Godhead. And then the minute you step behind the curtain to step off stage, all that disappears. And you are an empty pipe. And the pain of being that empty after being that full is more than you can take. So you use heroin. And it's the best description of what happens on a good night on stage to a good performer that I've ever seen. So suddenly I was in the land where the gods are. And it was through a, a series of total accidents. Wow. I've, ne I've never heard it explained that way, but you know, when, when I think about it, whenever there was a band that I really got into, it was like a culture in itself. Right. And I don't know, there was a certain feeling that I got when, like when I listened to Kiss. Kiss is one right. of my favorite bands. I mean, you could, if you see my office, it's wall to wall, nothing but Kiss. Fantastic. <laughs> and it was like, a, I was in a different world when i'm you know, really into my kiss phase but then i'll get into uh you know my metallica phase or what have you and or my beatles phase whatever and my my way of thinking and living changes as i right. you know i get into that that certain phase i can't explain it but the way well, you the said way I, the way i was uh, trying to explain it in those days and still do believe this is an explanation 
at the age of 11 and a half and 12 years old, strange things start to happen to you. Um, your hormones begin to hit. Right. And you make one of the most dr dramatic transitions a human ever goes through. You transition from childhood to being a sexual creature. And it's confusing as all hell. And your hormones are telling you it's time to get away from your parents. So they begin to smell bad to you. You begin to smell bad to them. And a whole bunch of other little things are driving you out of your parental home. Um, and, and when you are in that wandering stage mm -hmm. of being driven out of your parents' home, you have a whole lot of emotions you've never had before. And there are a whole lot of emotions, in fact, that no humans ever had before because you are being ejected from your home at the time of a new technological peak that has never happened before. And so you feel like you are insane. Everybody else around you is sane. You can see on their face, they're stable. You know, their nose stays in the same place, their eyes stay in the same place. Only you are insane. And then along comes a Joan Jett or uh, a Michael Jackson or a prince, mm -hmm. and you sense that person expressing something in you that you felt made you terribly alone. And you suddenly realize through that person, not only that you see an expression of it on stage, but you sense that you are not an isolated individual, that you're a part of a group of thousands, tens of thousands, or even tens of millions of people who are drawn together by this common expression of identity. Mm -hmm. And yes, with each band, that common expression of identity is a little different. The Grateful Dead used to be known for the cult that followed them around. And it right. was all into marijuana smoking and a certain style of visual art. And it was what, what we call in science a whole gestalt. It was a whole big picture of its very own. And when Fish tried to resurrect it, I would imagine their resurrection had characteristics that had never been a part of the Grateful Dead mm -hmm. before. And being into Iron Maiden, that's a radically different trip than being into Joni Mitchell. For and sure. yet, <laughs> Joni Mitchell was the voice of hundreds of millions of people. And, uh, and so was Iron Maiden. Um, so yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I never really paid attention to, you just brought it out for the first time, is that in theory, each act should have had a slightly different subculture that it, that it drew together around itself, but I never thought of that before. So a whole lot of these adventures, searching for the gods inside with people like Michael Jackson and Prince and Bob Marley and a whole bunch of others, are in the book, Einstein, Michael Jackson, and me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll, my latest book. Um, but this particular observation that you just made is not in the book because I never thought of it until you just mentioned it. And it's so obviously true. So now you got to rewrite the book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, it's amazing how it changes your 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 way of thinking, your mood, everything. Uh, I, I was a teenager when the hair metal scene really took off, you know, right. We, we had our hard rock and the heavy metal stuff, the, the, uh, you know, black Sabbath and all that. But then a band like quiet riot comes out, hits number one, you right. know, you got this new metal that we're listening to and, uh, it brings on your the poisons and twisted sisters and this, I mean I could go on and on and on, right? And at twelve, that's also when I started to experiment with alcohol and drugs and uh, we won't go into that. That's a right. <laughs> that's a rabbit hole I don't want to go down right now. But my attitude changed. I used to be the you know that sweet little boy that did everything that mommy and daddy said and you know, right you know, grandma and grandpa's little angel. And, and then I just did a whole 180 and <laughs> became a little devil. Right. So, but it was, a, it was, it was a whole different culture for me. If I listened, sometimes I'd be in the mood to listen to John Cougar, you know? Right. And, and he's so, another one of mine. Really? Yeah. That was, that was actually the first cassette tape I ever bought. Well, one day I was uh, driving a rental car down Sunset Boulevard, 
out in LA, because I used to spend a lot of time out there. And um, all of a sudden, a piece of music came on the radio, and I couldn't drive anymore. This is the only time this has ever happened to me in my life. Mm -hmm. I had to find a parking spot as quickly as I could and pull into it because I simply was incapable of driving. So I found a parking spot. I jackrabbited it into it. I turned up the radio and I listened all the way through this piece of music. And it was John Mellencamp's Hurt So Good. Yeah, the American Fool album. Yeah. And then two months later, somebody came into my office and said, would you like to work with John Mellencamp? And I mean, are you kidding me? After the power of that song? But I laid out my terms and conditions. You know, I get to spend I get to spend six weeks studying him. Then I get to go out to wherever is the place that reflects him most accurately and spend two days with no managers or intercessors of any kind. And they said, no, absolutely not. And then a few days later, uh, the same person came to me and said, look, I talked to John about it. He says, if that's the way you do things, then let you do your thing. And uh, and John and I worked together. He was the most, it's hard to say he was the most unpopular artist that I ever worked with. I liked working with unpopular artists, but ZZ Top uh, competes because ZZ Top, there was a headline in the Village Voice, which was the taste-making publication. Every crit rock critic anywhere in the United States imitated what was said in the Village Voice, repeated what was said in the Village Voice. And there was a big headline in the Village Voice that said, ZZ Top has a sound like hammered shit. So it's hard to get more unpopular than that, but John Mellencamp was more unpopular even than ZZ Top. And my task over the next three years, I was with him for seven years, but my task with him over the next three years was to totally turn that around. I mean, he was one of the most authentic artists you've ever encountered in your life. And the trick was to find that authenticity and then get the press to see it, which took three years. Mm. You know, it's funny you mentioned about ZZ Top, and I can't remember if it was Dusty or Billy, but I lived right down the street from him when I lived in Baycliff. Amazing. And then we moved up here to, uh, to the Austin area, and I was living north of Austin. Uh, Frank Beard lived about 10, 15 minutes away from me. Amazing. <laughs> and I, there's something about ZZ Top, man. I, I never got to see him live, but I always felt like, you know, hey, that's our, my Texas band, you know? Well, there were basically two geniuses behind ZZ Top. One was Billy Gibbons, who came from a very strange background. Um, and the other one was a guy you probably haven't heard of named Bill Ham. I, I have heard of Bill Ham. Ah, okay. So Bill Ham was the manager. And Bill Ham was so quiet in a group that you almost didn't know he was there. And he was very big. And if you got to work with him, it slowly dawned on you, this guy is fucking brilliant. And he was, he was just brilliant. So he was the secret Svengali um, behind the rise of ZZ Top. And I learned so much from him that it was ridiculous. Um, Cause when, when I started, uh, when I got my first record company mm -hmm. job, I realized that there was this big differentiation in the music industry back then. In those days, we sold this, these discs about this big um, called singles. Mm -hmm. And then these discs about this big 12 inches um, called albums. And the little ones had just one song on one side and one song on the other side. And the big ones had about 12 songs. And I realized that I got in, I tripped into this by tripping into a job as a magazine editor. And the magazine turned out to be about rock and roll. And at that point, I knew nothing about rock and roll, but it didn't matter. I felt that as long as I loved my audience and as long as I had adequate research material, I could write about anything. Mm -hmm. It was that Einstein imperative, remember? He said that if you're gonna be an original scientific thinker, you got to learn how to write and write really well, write accessibly so ordinary people can understand you um, and be delighted in what you're writing. So I took a, a job not knowing what the field was, and it turned out it was a rock and roll magazine. Um, and uh, oh, damn, where was I going with that story? Um, 
weirded out with, with ZZ Top. Um, what I slowly learned, what I learned immediately was there was a difference between singles artists and album artists. A singles artist would have a single that went up to the top of the charts, and then another single that went to the top of the charts, and the next year would be utterly and completely forgotten. But then you had artists who never had a single on the chart, and they sold albums. And in the music industry in those days, singles were loss leaders. You couldn't really make money off of singles, but you could make money off of albums. And I started doing correlational studies. Remember, I came out of science mm -hmm. to figure out what the difference was between singles and album artists. And it turned out that album artists were artists who toured and they toured yeah. relentlessly. And it turns out that touring works because we humans need social bonds. We don't survive without social bonds. When you throw yourself out of your family at the age of 12, you throw yourself into the arms of your peers, mm -hmm. of the other kids your age who are in your gang. But without either one, the family or the gang, if you had neither, it would be very hard to survive emotionally. You'd be in emotional pain yeah. all the time. And a concert is a bonding ceremony. Remember what I described about how the audience, their pupils dilate, their eyes widen, their faces melt, and they come together in one big 17,000 person amoebic blob mm -hmm. and then reach a pseudopod out to the performer on stage. That's a bonding experience. That's one of the most profound experiences of human connection that you can get. And you're bonding around something that you feel deep inside of you and has always made you feel insane and alone. And suddenly, no, it's verified, it's validated. Um, so the artists who go out and tour and tour and tour and tour, if they're really good on stage, if they hit these ecstatic moments, that's the ultimate bonding experience. That's where you and your gang found find your home is in rock concerts and the experience of getting off at a concert of that audience developing that feeling of being one big gigantic social blob mm -hmm. that emotional experience is not explored anywhere that i know of except in this book einstein michael jackson and me a search for soul in the power pits of rock and roll but that's the kind of ecstatic experience i was looking for when i was 12 years old and I tripped into it. I landed in rock and roll by accident. Um, and I accidentally landed in the land where the gods are. Well, if you landed in, the, we got to work with Kiss, then you were in the land of gods. Absolutely, yes, I got to work with them. Now, unfortunately, the project we embarked on didn't work. I don't like to fail. And I felt, feel I failed because the job was, to bring them out from behind the makeup um, and establish their legitimacy as musicians. And that did not turn out to be possible. Without the makeup, people were not interested. It was the fantasy that led to the makeup yeah. that Kiss was really all about. When you think about it, well, I mean, as a kid, I loved comic books, and this was like, comic books come to life on stage yes, because they love comic books as kids too right and that's where their fantasy world was and also as a little kid and not knowing any better i i saw these guys and i really thought gene simmons could spit fire and could you well, know gene simmons spit is, blood out of his mouth and gene simmons is fucking amazing <laughs> um, gene simmons sure. is not a normal human being by any stretch of the imagination he has this showbiz personality all the time. That's his normal personality. You call him on the phone, and the first thing he does is tell you a dirty joke of the day. Um, <laughs> his tongue is twice as long as any other human tongue. He's just, he's beyond the real. Um, yeah. and, and in all probability, Kyle, the only realm where he fits and feels comfortable is in the realm of the beyond the real. Um, I believe it. That, that's why he put together a band that has its real life in the realm beyond the real.
Well, the, I, the greatest thing I, that I ever discovered as a kid was the Kiss Army. That's where I felt like I belonged. Right, and I I went up to uh, remember I was carrying an art a bunch of artist portfolios, and I looked everywhere for people who might want to use art, and I tripped into the office of uh, a guy who had Kiss Army paraphernalia all over the place because he was Kiss's manager. So I got to see these concepts taking shape in his office. He was, he was phenomenal. I loved working with him. He later managed uh, um, Billy Idol, um, who became one of my acts too. Well, I love Billy Idol too. I, I had two giant posters of Billy Idol in my room because I wanted to be Billy Idol. I actually had the haircut and everything back in high school. Well, one thing you just <laughs> made me realize that Billy Idol had in common with Gene Simmons is that Billy Idol has no normal identity. Um, he is Billy Idol mm -hmm. all the time, 24 hours a day. Um, he, you know, I made my usual demand about going to see him in his, in, in his environment and he turned the tables on me. He was living on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And instead of my coming down to see him in his environment, he came up to see me in my office, which is not really the way to do things. Right. But when he walked in, he didn't walk in in a suit and tie. He didn't walk in in jeans and a work shirt. He walked in with a leather vest and chains and crosses and leather pants. In other words, Billy Idol walked into my office because that's who Billy really was. Um, yeah. I learned a lesson very early on in my time in rock and roll when I was first a magazine editor, rock and roll magazine editor. The magazine was called Circus Magazine. And, um, and I discovered using my scientific techniques that my audience was more interested in Alice Cooper than anybody else on planet Earth. So I started to spend a lot of time, of time with Alice Cooper so I could have an article about them every single issue. And um, I was down at Shep Gordon's office. Shep was their manager. And, um, and Shep told me that Alice Cooper, Vince Fernier, had grown up someplace in the Southwest, Arizona, I think. Mm -hmm. And he had grown up as not really a normal kid. His mom dressed him in a suit and tie every morning for school. He was the teacher's pet, which meant the other kids hated him. And they used to love beating him up. They called him the schnoz. I could relate to that. The kids used to call me that too, meaning he had a big nose. Mm -hmm. um, he was basically humiliated in school. And then in high school, they had a talent show. And he signed up to do a musical act and he came out in some early version well wait let's let's suspend that part of the story and um he was around 16 years old and a neighbor was in his kitchen and the neighbor had a ouija board and with the ouija board she claimed to make contact with the ghost of a witch who had died in the 1600s mm -hmm. And the witch said, my name is Alice Cooper. You're my reincarnation to Vince Fernier. No so, way. Yes. So when Vince Fernier went on stage, he didn't go on stage as Vince Fernier. He went on stage as Alice Cooper, the witch. And, wow. and he did so well that all the members of the football team who'd beaten him up all their lives together came to the foot of the stage and begged to be in his band. And so what I learned from this story, which I've got inaccuracies in, I'm sure, but what I learned from this story, as I heard it from Shep, is you often have a personality in you that is much more alive than the personality of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And if you are true that. to that personality and you let it speak with its own passion, you too just may be able to be a star. And what is that hidden personality inside of you, the kind of soul that I'm looking for when I talk in the, in the subtitle of the book about a search for soul and the power of its rock and roll? That's one of the gods inside of you. And it comes most alive in front of an audience when it brings the gods inside that audience to life too. 
which is why they come to see you, because you are the living tongue of the soul of the group, of the gods inside that group. I, you just made me think of something, and I don't mean to jump off the subject here, but you were talking about the, the Ouija board, which right. reminded me, I, I had a paranormal question to ask you. Aha. Uh -huh. Because I, I am a paranormal investigator. Right. And uh, mostly I just investigate ghosts and things like that. But uh, I have friends and acquaintances that are into cryptids and UFOs and this kind of thing. And we've noticed that a lot of times when you see one of those three, somehow all three end up being connected in the same area. That's interesting. And my theory is, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I think they're interdimensional beings. Well, I have no idea. There, I'm sure there are lots of things uh, that are not uh, encompassed in my philosophy of life. And I've never been terribly into the paranormal. I mean, the, the strange thing is that I got my job at Circus Magazine because I was busy. I, I had managed to waggle my way uh, into being a contributing editor to two magazines. This is while I was running the art studio. And one day I was at a paranormal conference of all things. And I had a pad in my left hand because I have no memory whatsoever. And if something interesting happens and I don't write it down immediately, it's gone. I will never remember it. So I was busy scribbling notes and somebody walked up to me and said, would you like to edit a magazine? And I didn't even ask what the magazine was about. I had been getting up at six in the morning in order to write and then going off to the art studio and coming home and writing until 11 o'clock at night. It was getting tiring. And I thought, wow, if I edit a magazine, then I can write during the day mm -hmm. um, and get up at normal hours. So I said, yes, not knowing what in the world the magazine was about. And it just so happened to be about rock and roll. I wouldn't learn that until I went for my meeting with the publisher. So, um, but the real realm of the paranormal has not cropped up in, well, in my life. I guess um, I should have been a little more specific. Um, I'm, what about the, the uh, different dimensions? Do you believe that there are other well, dimensions? Well, yes, there are multiple dimensions. Einstein says that there are four dimensions um to this universe you know a depth width height um and uh time and um yes so i believe that there are other dimensions to that extent um but beyond that i just don't know i haven't like, really i mean you know we take it for granted in physics and cosmology and look at my big bagel theory mm -hmm. um that has uh universes on two different surfaces, the surfaces of the bagel, and then there's this space in between them through which they communicate with gravity. Um, but I now I'm these things are beyond I've never experienced them. I go on coast to coast AM, which is the leading paranormal show. In fact, it's the leading syndicated talk right. radio show in North America. So I'm on every Wednesday night at, at 106 in the morning doing news commentary. And despite all the paranormal stuff that goes on in that show, no, we don't discuss the paranormal. I get to discuss the real world, at least the real world as I see it. <laughs> now, hey, I can take offense to that. I think the paranormal is a real world. Right. Well, it's uh, I haven't encountered it. So, I mean, look where I'm exploring. I'm exploring the gods inside of us. That mm -hmm. is certainly off the beaten track of psychology and neuroscience, although there is an interesting experiment. And in neuroscience, it's called, it uses something called electromagnetic, um, well, it's a magnetic way of applying a magnetic force to the brain. And, um, and using it, if you stimulate the right part of the brain with uh, magnetism, you can produce, even in the most profound atheist, a deep religious experience. So, Paranormal experiences are in there for us to comprehend somewhere. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are real, but the sense of things that are transcendent is in there, just waiting to be stimulated. I mean, at one point, the Dutch were making a, uh, a, an hour-long special based on my second book, Global Brain, The Evolution of Mass Mind from the Big Bang to the 21st Century. And the, the Dutch 
a commentator who was like the Walter Cronkite of Holland, but much younger, was this astonishingly good looking guy. And when he came into my apartment, uh, my jaw dropped. And um, I set him up for a session with my mentor in neuroscience, a guy named Ted Coons. And Ted Coons, this, this gorgeous looking um, guy from Holland was a total stone cold atheist who swore that he had never had a spiritual experience in his life and he never was going to have one. And my friend Ted Kuhn set him up to have this magnetic force applied to the God part of the brain and whammo. He had this astonishing spiritual experience. So there are strange experiences in there. Um, whether they relate to things in the exterior world, I'm, I'm not sure. It's an area I avoid. Um, to go on an, on an investigation sometime. Well, yeah, that could be interesting. Uh, <laughs> I never thought of, of course, I never, uh, I'm so busy writing. I write all my waking hours or I work all my waking hours running my four space groups and, um, and writing and God knows what all else. Thank and then we have this new thing called the Howard Bloom Institute, which is here to, to make sure that my work and my way of thinking survives after I croak. Um, and that's taking time. So going on a paranormal expedition would probably not fit into my schedule. So you have to do something for fun every once in a while. Well, I guess that's true. You have a website, correct? It's howardbloom.net. Howardbloom.net. And then you, you can get all your books and everything. On that site too right yep yep and there's another one called howard bloom all one word and bloom is with two o's dot institute and that's the howard bloom institute okay and what about social media social media i'm on uh, twitter and i'm on uh, uh skype and um it's really it's facebook where i do most of what i do i've been too busy over the last year to to do much social media mediaizing but um and i think my name on twitter is howard x bloom um and uh and i'm not sure what my name is but it's howard bloom on facebook but facebook is the best place to see what i'm up to well i'm gonna put those links in the description and um uh, howard we have run out of time but um well, this has been a pretty interesting conversation to say the least well kyle it's been a pleasure and you're always welcome back if you have anything else you want to talk about. You can talk about how I made you rewrite a book. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Have a great evening. You too. And um, for those of you that are, have joined us, if you're new to the channel, thank you for stopping by. I hope you please subscribe. And for those of you who are regular, thank you for your support. It's because of you. We do what we do. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.